welcome to Inference, an AI business podcast by Silo AI. I'm Ville Hulko, co-founder of Silo, the largest private AI lab in the Nordics that focuses on building human-centric AI for businesses. With the Inference podcast, we introduce a number of topics and people of the global AI scene that every business decision maker should know. With me today is Sabrina Maneskalko. Sabrina is a professor of quantum information computing and logic at the University of Helsinki, as well as an adjunct professor at Aalto University. Sabrina is also the co-founder and CEO of Algorithmic, a quantum computing algorithm development startup focusing on solving real-world impact challenges through quantum computing. Sabrina, it's a privilege to have you with us. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I'm very happy to chat about uh, quantum computing and uh, uh, machine learning and the intersection between the two, because it's really a fascinating topic. Lovely. And Sabrina, I kind of gave a short introduction to you in the beginning, but I think it would be perfect if you could actually introduce yourself in a bit more detail. So who are you? Yes, so uh, I'm Sabrina, uh, Sabrina Maniscalco, Sicilian uh, and Italian as well, of course, but I always say I'm Sicilian because uh, I really feel I belong to my to my island. Uh, and I moved uh, to Finland, um, It's it was in 2005, so now many, many years ago, uh, when I started my postdoc in the University of Turku. And uh, and since then I've been, uh, for, with the exception of three years in which I, um, when I got my first professorship in in Edinburgh, uh, I've been living happily uh, in uh, in Finland, although my Finnish is still uh, rather poor. <laughs> I have to confess. Um, uh, and then uh, I my, my research field is uh, quantum technologies. I, I'm a theorist, so despite I collaborate with experimentalists, uh, generally I don't go into the lab, uh, but uh, I collaborate generally with uh, with people who do experiments. I like it very much because uh, theoretical physics and quantum, te- specifically quantum technologies, um, are nowadays really reaching a situation in which um, a lot of applications are possible, also in industry. So not just experimental physics, but also real um, applications that promise really to be groundbreaking and to change uh, a number of technologies. Um, what else? I uh, like very much sauna uh, and uh, I uh, love uh, road trips uh, and uh, being in the nature. Uh, so this is uh, additional information about uh, who I am, uh, perhaps as important as me being a professor of quantum information <laughs> and computing. <laughs> Yeah, those are traits that are very well fit for a Nordic audience, put it that way, as we discuss about the topic. And Sabrina, getting us into the topic of quantum computing itself, um, it's a term known to pretty much all who follow the trends of technology, but I'd argue that fewer are aware about the current state of quantum computing applicability today. So can you talk about how quantum computing is relevant and how is it being utilized today? Yes, uh, so quantum computing has become uh, more and more relevant for a number of applications uh, of um, everyday use and for our society. Uh, about 20 years ago, when I started uh, working in this field, um, it was just a theoretical uh, exercise, if you want. It was it was quantum physics has always been fascinating and bizarre, and the behavior of uh, the fundamental um, constituents of of, uh, of our universe, molecules and, and atoms, uh, was was just very counterintuitive, so to say. But nobody thought that the specific properties of like quantum correlations and uh, quantum superpositions, that is the ability, if you want, of uh, uh, particles of being uh, here and there into different uh, opposite states at the same time, nobody thought uh, that this could be um, really leading to any change in our technologies or any um, near-term application. Uh, This changed about uh, 20 years ago, uh, and actually we saw that, I think it was Yesterday, or I don't remember if yesterday or two days ago, there was the announcement of the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics uh, to uh, Alana Spe, uh, Anton Zeilinger, and uh, and um, Clauser uh, for um, quantum, specifically for fundamentals of quantum physics that led to the beginning of quantum information theory. Uh, and uh, so, so therefore, uh, quantum computers nowadays um, exist 
they exist in a small form, if we want. They exist in a manner that is still far from the fault tolerance or error corrected computers that we work with, uh, like our lap my laptop or, or my, my computer. So they are in their infancy, but they are accessible. It is possible to run uh, programs or software or algorithms on quantum devices uh, on the cloud. Uh, and they are evolving, so the hardware is evolving very, very rapidly, hand in hand with the software and with the algorithms. So while right now there is no single practical application uh, that can be performed on a quantum computer in a manner which is superior to any classical programs, there are many proof of principle experiments and there is a clear um, roadmap and a clear scaling. So there are results and there are theoretical results and experimental results that show that soon we will reach a level and with soon I can uh, I can elaborate. Um, it can be five years or it can be 15 years, depending on applications. We will reach levels in, in which um, we will have this superiority of the quantum machines uh, with respect to uh, any classical device. And talking about the proof itself and the most likely aspects where quantum computing would be applied in practical scenarios, the first, uh, what do you actually see being the first areas of application of quantum computing? Personally, I believe that the most, uh, so the first areas of application uh, will be in simulations of, of quantum systems. So uh, what does it mean simulating or emulating other quantum system? It basically means um, the fact that uh, to fully, uh, let's make an example, a concrete example that could be a material or a molecule. Um, to fully describe uh, um, quantum mechanical systems like materials or, or um, or molecules using classical computers is uh, very difficult and in fact up to a certain extent impossible. So when, if the complexity of the molecules, let's say the size of the molecules increases, we reach quickly levels where we don't even have enough memory in our computers to store the full um, description, if you want, of the molecule. Uh, and this is a very fundamental limit. So uh, this is something which um, it, it's not, um, if you want, incremental. We, we do know that it is impossible to do it, impossible to store the information of, a, of the, the full information about the description of a molecule on a classical computer. However, quantum computers, they are possessing the same properties uh, as, as other quantum systems like molecules. And therefore, they can use uh, the properties that are characteristic of this quantum system uh, to emulate their behavior. So we use quantum computers to emulate the behavior of other quantum systems like molecules. And this allows us to predict properties that are then useful for quantum chemistry and in turn to, for example, um, simulate the binding of the molecules to protein po pockets, which is a problem very important to, to, uh, to design drugs that are successful. So, so you see that the line is here really, in a way, learning from nature, how to simulate nature in a controllable manner. There are certain uh, systems which, which exist in nature that are quantum mechanical, but that we cannot control directly because we cannot access, because they are in the middle of, you know, maybe there are some molecules that are part of cells in our body. There can be a number of reasons why we cannot access them directly, but that we can simulate controllably their behavior on uh, quantum machines. And it's really interesting to hear because as quantum computing is a bit of a hype term, it's been used and referred to as a lot in, in the media. It's, it's one of the hot topics there. But at the same time, the way that I hear you refer to it is that the practical application of quantum computing is still kind of uh, in a fledgling state, if you will. And it's not dissimilar to how the first like practical applications of AI were in like back in 2016, back in 2017. You know, when the hype was there, the promise that AI will eat the world was there. But strangely, it was nowhere in sight when it came to practical matters. So like reflecting back to that, like what would you say is kind of the one key takeaway we or the people should understand about quantum computing and its role as a toolkit of technology? Yeah, I would, I would like to say not one, but three, if I can. <laughs> so the very first one is that 
there is a difference between two modalities uh, of quantum computation. The first one is the so-called near term, and the other one is the error corrected one. So quantum computers is one word that um, encompasses many types of hardware, many types of devices. It's not just one device, it can be many things. But people very often use just one word, that is quantum computer, to mean many things. And that's why this often creates confusion and also the hype certainly doesn't help because uh, you, you, you tend to associate uh, properties um, and characteristic of uh, a type of device, that is, for example, the error corrected fault tolerant or universal quantum computer to a device which is the one that exists now that is very different. It, it, for example, its specific purpose, it is used for only for simulations and so on and so forth. So this mixing, it's something that is, uh, I find, um, very potentially dangerous because it creates confusion, it creates false expectations, and it also creates um, really uh, hype which is, which is not useful really to, to the community at large. Um, but what is certain is that it is clear already now with the um, imperfect uh, devices that we have um, that we are able to manipulate them to create those quantum properties like entanglement that in turn enable to perform operations that are not possible classically in any manner. So this, this we know for sure. And we know that we will get little by little to a point in which um, the, the perfection of the device will um, allow, will enable uh, modalities of computations that allow error correction and therefore allow to really scale up um, without the limitations that we are observing now. So this is one takeaway. We should distinguish between the so-called error-corrected corrected fault tolerant quantum device 15 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, from what we have now, which is, which is really not perfect, but it is useful already now. The second takeaway is that in order to use the near-term devices now in a way that can lead to applications, uh, for example, in chemistry, we, we, we have to be able to clean them from noise. This is precisely what my startup algorithmic is doing. So we are obviously figuring out how to extract the useful information from the computer and how to clean it up to recover the original quantumness. In a way, it's very similar to, you know, when you have a pixelated image, an image which is, um, you know, with, with imperfections, uh, and you use machine learning to clean uh, the image, you know, to make it perfect. In a very similar manner, you can extract the data from a quantum computers, which are imperfect, and you can cancel the noise. Got it. And you refer to as machine learning as a parallel. So let's use that as a perfect segue to start discussing about the relationship between quantum computing and machine learning in itself. Um, so previously in our discussions, you've referred to machine learning having two different kinds of relationships with quantum computing. So can you introduce what these two approaches are? So quantum machine learning is one of the applications of quantum computers that is most promising. Uh, and generally, when we refer to quantum machine learning, we consider two different aspects. Um, the first one is the, the application of, so to say, classical or conventional machine learning combined with quantum computers. And the other one is uh, quantum computers as an answer uh, of machine learning um, per se. So I, I will try to explain these two uh, separately. So the first one is the situation in which uh, when using near-term devices, uh, we need to use in combination classical and quantum algorithms. This is just because they are so, so small and so imperfect. And in particular, this means that um, you extract uh, from the quantum computer the data just by measuring or reading out. Uh, and then we want to use a procedure to optimize the data that we extracted in all possible manners. And this optimization include also machine learning Learning, uh, machine learning techniques. So this is one, one part. And then there is the other part that is the, the, the fact that it is uh, um, demonstrated uh, theoretically uh, that actually uh, quantum computers can be enabling machine learning per se, so can be the core of machine learning algorithms that could empower them 
really from a computational perspective, to break frontiers which are not, um, not possible until now. So we call them classical quantum machine learning and quantum quantum machine learning in a way. So classical quantum is, is uh, the use of uh, classical machine learning for quantum, and quantum is the use of quantum machines for machine learning. Interesting. And uh, could you give us a practical example about the former? So if we were to use quantum computing and then another classical computing instance that is running machine learning in itself to supplement rather the calculations that the quantum computing is putting out. So what would be a practical example of this kind of a use case? Yes, um, I would say that the, the full quantum machine learning is actually um, the situation in which both the learning device and the system under studies are treated in a fully quantum mechanical way. Uh, and, and therefore, um, we, we know that um, the type of or the classes of problems that can be um, treated in this manner uh, with this fully quantum mechanical approach, approach uh, is, for example, learning or unknown uh, quantum states or quantum processes on, or, or measures measurements. Um, in some sense, this is, um, these are very typical quantum mechanical problems, per se. Um, but if we think in terms of, uh, of instead, uh, um, more, uh, let's say, things which are closer uh, to, uh, to what classical machine learning does, then perhaps the closest one would be the quantum neural networks uh, that are quantum analogs. They are really generalization of classical neural nets. And are, um, in this case, they would be so there are different implementations, for example, using photons or using uh, some variational circuits. But in general, they are um, they would be allowing uh, to let's say reach uh, in terms of computational powers other limits with respect to what is possible uh, with the, without them. So so if you want the application is uh, uh, it's, there is not a specific application for which you can say this is uh, for this specific application this would be better. It's just having a, a boost uh, to the class classical machine learning, a boost that is uh, provided uh, by the um, superior capability or computational capability of the quantum computer. So very often the way in which I, I see um, quantum computers is, uh, is, is that you know, the quantum computers they will never replace classical computers, but it's, it's like having like an external uh, an external booster that only for certain specific problems uh, can perform better than the classical one. So. I think that this is uh, perhaps the best way of, uh, of understanding it, and it is not my feeling, so I, I don't know um, a lot about quantum machine learning, but we do use classical machine learning uh, for um, quantum algorithms that are hybrid in my company. So this is the part I know the most, um, least uh, about, uh, about really the fully quantum one. Got it. And before you mentioned the theoretical approach to quantum machine learning, so would you be able to comment on like what in your perspective is kind of the readiness level, if you will, of quantum machine learning in itself? Is it to your knowledge being applied today or is it still um, a theoretical concept? Uh, it is. Uh, there are experiments uh, on quantum machine learning uh, with small devices. Uh, however, uh, consider uh, once again that the size of the quantum computers of today, and they are um, the high, the biggest quantum computer has 127 quantum bits. That is, quantum bits are the analog of the classical bits. So, 127 bits. You can imagine it's not a lot. 127 quantum bits can be a lot. Um, in particular, it can be it can be sufficient to simulate uh, sufficiently complex molecules uh, to be um, impossible to simulate classically. Uh, so therefore, um, the, the the point is uh, is that in any case, uh, with these experiments, um, you can only achieve with the status um, of, of the computers now in the fully quantum machine learning. Uh, um, framework, you can achieve a proof of principle, but you cannot achieve anything at the moment that uh, can be, let's say, can perform better uh, than classical or conventional machine learning. So the, the tipping points, if you want, in which uh, quantum machine learning is used uh, or, is it, or, or is better than the classical um, software, the classical uh, algorithms has not has not yet reached, and I think personally that um, for fully exploiting uh, quantum machine learning, uh, 
really to, to its full extent, we will need to wait um, that uh, fault-tolerant quantum computers are deployed. And fault-tolerant quantum computers are quantum computers that use logical qubits, um, meaning qubits that are um, corrected, so they are ideal. Uh, and, but this correction um, has a very, very heavy overhead. So uh, in, it is estimated that you need about 1,000 uh, physical qubits uh, to implement one logical qubit. So 1,000 just for one. So you can imagine that if we need uh, at least 60 uh, qubits for performing tasks that are not um, simulable classically, that means uh, this automatically gives uh, 60,000, and we, we have maximum 127. So it's just to say we are far <laughs> from, uh, we are far, I mean, how far in terms of time is difficult to say, but I would say maybe 10, 15 years. Got it. Sabrina, we're starting to reach the end of the episode, but as is customer in inference, we love to predict the future, be it through <laughs> machine learning or quantum machine learning. And uh, I'd love to get a prediction out of you. So, um, of course, technology will change the world and everything will be transformed within the next couple of years. But to maybe get a bit of a more realistic estimation on the development of quantum computing, uh, what would be your prediction or foresight to the next three to five years? Like if we go three to five years into the future, how will the field of quantum computing look like there? What will be the next milestones that the field will begin tackling? Yes, um, this is a very nice question and this is a very exciting question for us because here at Algorithmic we have discovered the missing ingredient indeed for um, for uh, achieving quantum advantage for chemistry simulations. So we have in our roadmap um, to achieve quantum, quantum advantage for chemistry already next year. So maybe it will not be next year, it will be in one year and a half, uh, but it's going to be soon. And the moment, for me, this is really the moment uh, in which the community will have, for something which is useful, uh, demonstrated superiority with respect to any classical software. And uh, following these, uh, there will be the application to life sciences, and in particular to drug development and discovery, for which we plan to have already commercial applications within three years. So I, I believe that really the, the biggest milestone, so if you want the holy grail of the whole field, that then will unlock all the possibility and practical applications is the demonstration for a useful and then practical, industrially relevant um, use case, the superiority of algorithms running on quantum computers with respect to the state of the art classical computer. So th that's my, my prediction. And, and th this is also where uh, we are the most excited. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much for that, Sabrina. And uh, for anyone listening, I do encourage you to first go to YouTube and look look up uh, one of the numerous lectures that Sabrina has given. Um, I certainly <laughs> have, and they are, they're quite enlightening. And then I also strongly encourage you to go to Google up Algorithmic. So the last letter is a Q, not, not a C, Algorithmic. Um, and see see what the company is all about. And with that, Sabrina, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a really enlightening conversation. Thanks for uh, sharing your insights with us. Thank you. It was really nice to chat. And for anyone listening, have a great day. Bye.